thank you for thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, I understand that this subject is a continuation or is part of a whole conversation, which is a very important conversation about the relevance of Judaism in the 21st century. I would rephrase it or complement that uh, idea with the saying. Are we making Judaism relevant for the generation right, of the 21st century? For our children, for the youth, and for the generations to come? Judaism or the Torah was not given just for the generation that stood in Har Sinai. Judaism or the Torah was given for all of us, for forever. And our task is not to change Judaism and to adapt the Torah to modern circumstances. Our task is to, is to translate the Torah to a language and to terms and ideas that can be understood by our youth. And we do believe that there is a possibility, of course, and an obligation to translate the Torah for them. Because this is not something empty, or let me retranslate rec by, it's not something irrelevant, mikem, because of you. Hachamim said, if the Torah becomes an irrelevant book, an empty book, it's because of us, it's because we are not teaching it correctly. Right? It is the word of Borea Olam. As such, being that it is the word of Borea Olam, I'm going now to our subject. Can the Torah contradict science? You understand my question? Can you find a contradiction between Torah and science? Can you? Should you? Yes or not, and why? What do you think? Can I open questions? Or to, 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 to? I think you can, and you should. And you should? I think you can contradict Torah and science. I think you should contradict Torah and science, but you should resolve Torah right. and science as well. Right. What, what you mean is that you, you should confront <coughs> Torah with science, but there is one thing. We believe that the Torah is the word of Borei Olam, is the word of God. And science just discovers the word of Borei Olam. In a sense, both the word and the Torah, they have the same author. Right? So there shouldn't be a contradiction. If we do find contradictions when we confront them, is because, either because we are reading incorrectly the world, or because we are reading incorrectly the Torah. That is my belief. <clears throat> Otherwise, you shouldn't find a contradiction between them. So, I want to present to you, depending on how much time we have, and depending also of how much interest you will, you will have, uh, four or five examples of some ideas that apparently, you know, in these ideas we see the Torah and science confronted, which of course affects our youth. We all send our children, or we aspire to send our children to college. We want for them a strong academic education. We want them to be lawyers or doctors or accountants or you name it, right? We, this is, now, in, in that sense, we belong to the modern orthodox world. Now, do you know how many young Jewish orthodox adults, when they go to, to college, they finish college, 
with less religion or sometimes has relation with no religion at all? Is that something that affects the minority, the majority, half and half? What do you think? To what extent college education or what they get there affects their faith? What do you think? 72%. Excuse me? 72%. 72%. Wow, that's a lot. Maybe more. Maybe more. Yes, sir. In my opinion, it's more anti-Semitism is in the country. Yeah, 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 it's yes, less, yes. It's less assimilation is. Right. Yes, yes, that, 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 that's true. Yes, so, okay. Th that is a very <laughs> complex subject. You know, we, we should maybe <laughs> have one... Uh, uh, one class just for that. And it's not only about science or when they learn some scientific things that they, their faith is affected. It's also psychology, it's a sociology, many, many, many things. But science is one of them, all right? Because if you, if you were educated in a religious school and then you hear that, unlike what your teacher told you, the world doesn't have 6,000 years, it has six billion years, okay? Oh, there are really, really solid proofs for evolution. Oh, oh you think uh, in terms of pre-Big Bang, etc., etc. Our children, our youth, they get lost. And it's like, you remember the, what happened with Rabbi Akiva and the drop of water that was perforated at the end they get so much indoctrination that uh, this information penetrates and perforates the faith. Uh, yes. Do we say perhaps that the reason why college has an effect on children is because first of all, it's the first time they're leaving the community, so to speak, and then when they go to college, not necessarily that they're learning a different idea, but that they're seeing that there are people out there who could be good people, and they don't keep any of its what, they don't have to do anything special, and, and they believe they're yes. good, and yes. they do good for other people. I believe it's a combination of social life, of campus life, but sometimes of, uh, you know how much anti-Israeli propaganda you have in the campus? I know kids that, uh, you know, they had a full, complete uh, Jewish religious education, and after college, they become pro-Palestinians. <laughs> because there's too much indoctrination. And you believe that, oh, this is the, this is the revealed truth. Right? <laughs> so I, I think it has a very simple reason to that. Most of the universities have police and departments. Right. Most of these departments are paid for by the Saudis. Wow. And they put Palestinians there. Yes. So what do you expect the kids to learn? Right, right, right. So when you send them to school, there should yes. be someone who should advise them. Yes. They, they should have problem. someone, exactly, exactly, yes, yes. They, the subject is very complex. It's not complex, it's very simple. <laughs> okay, I, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that it's send complex. The kids to college, you teach them to, to become a doctor, but to teach them the religion, you should have at home. If you have a strong right, right. upbringing, if you 100%. have a strong home, you can send them to college because you can. That, that's exactly my point. This is my point. My point is that we have to give them very, very, very solid education. Now, are we giving them this education? And for, I'll give you an example. I know a guy, religious guy, traditional religious, and um, <coughs> this guy was, was learning for many <coughs> people, you know, biology, pre-med, but you have to take some elective courses. And he was studying in NYU. So in NYU, one of the elective courses was Bible. Bible? So he said, well, this, this is going to be easy for me because, you know, I, I know. So I'm going to go to that course. That course almost destroyed him. Why? Because in NYU, you are exposed to biblical criticism. They don't teach you the story of Yosef al Sadiq. They teach you that everything that is written in the Torah is not true. <coughs> it's an invasion, in, invention of the ancient Israelites that they lied, they borrow everything from the Sumerians and from the Akkadians and from the, uh, from the Babylonians. They copy everything. Nothing is true. <coughs> Your faith is shaken. So that's why I said it's, it's 
complex because there are so many different angles from which this can come. Social is one of them. Academic is another of them. Science is also one of them. To some, it depends also on your mindset. Some people have you know, interest in creation, in evolution. Some people don't have at all. For those who do have, it's a challenge. So I want to I want to start with some examples, okay? And I want to I want to simplify them. I I, I wrote a book about uh, cosmology, which is a, a perusion of the first three pesukim of the Torah. So I will refer you to the, to to the book if you really want to go in deep, because otherwise you know we will be here for instead of just two hours and a half for four hours, right? <laughs> Um, so I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, I also finished writing another book. It's called Dinosaurs in the Bible, uh, aside from also creation, which touches not about upon cosmology but about upon evolution, right? Which is more complex, more complicated, more sophisticated than, than uh, more difficult than cosmology. So l l let me start and very briefly four or five examples. <coughs> is the Big Bang? The theory of the Big Bang, a theory that contradicts the Torah, supports the Torah, is parallel to the Torah, they don't touch each other. What do you think? Contradicts the Torah. Why does it contradict the Torah? Because it has no God in that. It doesn't have God creating the world. Right, right. There is no God created the world. Science says God did not create the world, the world created by itself by uh, a big explosion. Right. What else contradicts the Torah in the theory of Big Bang? Why can't we say that God created the Big Bang? Why does it go Big Bang? Okay, but the m normal popular um, wisdom says that, you know, Big Bang contradicts the Torah. What else is there that contradicts the Torah? Uh, what the from Aramisium? The Big Bang said there was a little m one cellular or Right, right, thing. right. What else? There is something else very, very important that in the theory of Big Bang that apparently contradicts the Torah. The time, time, like 15 billion years. As opposed to, we said what, 14 billion years? <laughs> the, the, the difference is not something marginal, because well, there is this margin of error, a 1% difference. It's <laughs> 14 billion against 6,000, not even 6,000. Can 6, I make a suggestion? Sure. You know, they say Hashem completed the world yeah. in seven days. But he didn't retire. Uh -huh. He was the most powerful uh, thing that exists in the world. We don't even know what he is. <coughs> the rabbis don't know what he is. The scientists for sure don't know what he is. That's a very good point. But since he has the power to do whatever he wants, so then all these changes are some of the changes he was handling. Mm. But that, 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 that's a, you're talking about evolution. No, 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 let me tell you why, okay? Yeah. Uh, the scientists say all of the terrible <coughs> change economy, all these animals died. <coughs> Who right. says Hashem didn't do it? Right, right, right. right. It's very exactly. simple. Yes. Most people complicate things to make themselves look good. Okay. Mm -hmm. The real simple thing is Hashem didn't like it because they were ugly. All right. Okay. Okay. Let's let's we we, go, we will get there, but let me go a little slower. Okay, so let me focus for now in the Big Bang, all right? So we have two, two issues here, right? That apparently contradict. What they don't teach you in school, for sure not in college, but unfortunately, they don't teach you in high school, and they should, is that the Big Bang, at the beginning, was seen, when I say the beginning, I'm, I'm talking about 1910, was seen as a very religious theory, as the closest that science had ever got to the biblical narrative. Can I explain to you why? Because before 1930, before 1930, all scientists believed in Aristotle's idea of the world that said that the world is eternal and for thousands of years science had this strong theory that was um, they found evidence that was sustained 
by all the evidence that you see around you. There is no point in heaven, as we see it right now, in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, that the world had a beginning. Everything goes in orbits. It's circular. It's infinite, eternal. Aristotle believed in a God that was parallel to the universe. The universe was, the universe was never created. There is, there is no point zero. You understand? In Hebrew, it's called Olam Kadmon. So forever, the rabbis discuss and, and argue with scientists or uh, Aristotelian philosophers in the Middle Ages, like the champion was Aramba, okay? Saying, you know, we do believe in the beginning of the world. They said, no, what is the beginning of the world? This goes against science and against common sense. What do you have? Do you have any proof in science? Do you have anything that, that shows that? Uh, no, just the Torah is very shit. In the beginning, there was a beginning. Everything changed in 1930. Because in 1930, Edwin Hubble, with his incredible telescope, he discovered something amazing. To make a very long story short, he discovered the expansion of the universe. He saw that the universe was expanding, not going in orbits and in circles. And 10, 15 years later, they developed this very common sense theory, which was very difficult to develop because there was a lot of um, opposition to it. Guess from where this opposition came from? From a religious point of view, from a theological point of view. Albert Einstein, who was not religious at all, he hated <coughs> the Big Bang Theory. He wanted to find some loophole, some sort of explanation that would not require the Big Bang. Because the Big Bang was stating, declaring that there was a, a, a beginning in time for the world, for the universe. You know, uh, uh, some scientist says, well, this, the, the scientist, yeah, for you. Uh, some prominent religious figures like Pope, Pope Pius XII welcomed the Big Bang enthusiastically. In 1951, when still there was a romance between science and religion because, you know, finally they got together and while the Big Bang model was still being confronted with other cosmological theories, Pius XII delivered an address to the Pontifical Academy of Science entitled The Proofs of the Existence of God in the Light of Modern Natural Science. In other words, the Big Bang. There he endorsed the Big Bang theory and considered it a modern evidence of the existence of God. Are you listening? All right? So, that was the beginning of it. Now, how many of you have learned about the Big Bang Theory? How many of you? Raise your hand. I, I presume all of you. How many of you knew this? That the Big Bang is a revolution that actually shows, and, and, and in that, uh, it, uh, it is similar to the Torah, it concerns the Torah, that the Big Bang and the Torah, both of them are saying, well, there was a point zero. Most secular scientists are opposed until today. There are different secular scientists. Some of them are very anti-religious, like Carl Sagan, Stephen Hawking, etc. Stephen Hawking and Carl Sagan, they want to debunk. They want to uh, have an alternative to the Big Bang. So they say, oh, Big Bang, but there was also a big crunch. It's a big bang, but a big crunch, so you have some kind of orbit, some kind of um, uh, no point of beginning. Oh, there are multiverses. There is no evidence at all. Not for the big crunch, not for the uh, multi-universe. Multi now, if I don't know this, then I'm going to be facing the big bang. Uh, wow. My teachers in, in high school, in Jewish high school, were wrong. They didn't know what they were talking about. But you know what? We were reading, we, I say, I, when I say we, I mean humanity, we were reading the world wrongly. Once we read the world correctly and we saw that the universe is expanding and you know and which means that there was a point zero, then 
Torah and science, they coincide. You understand what I'm saying? So two books, when we read wrongly one of them, then we find we have a problem. It took thousands of years until we were able to read correctly Pebbles. But the Torah said it a long time ago. What about the age of the world? Now, what, what you said uh, is, is very nice. Borel Lam can't do anything. That's right. Now, one of the things, again, let's read correctly what the Torah says. And I think in, he, here we are failing a little bit. Do you have a Hubash? Yes. Yeah, very yes. yes. Very simple thing. So, thank you. Thank you, So I, I had this question since I was like 14, because I always loved science. I don't know whom to believe. Uh, 6,000 6, years or, or 15 billion years? What is the truth? You cannot find a middle way here and there. And of course, I bought at the beginning the theory as well, every day. It's like uh, one billion years, so you know six billion, so six days, etc. But I, I, I think I was wrong. And let me let me tell you what Hazal said about this. Of course, Hazal didn't have this question. Our rabbis didn't have this question. They were dealing with Olam Kadmon. They said, you know, Bachrok David the world was created uh, first, or life was created first, etc. But they couldn't discuss the age of the world, okay? Now, there is something in the Torah that our rabbis, our Chachamim, they, they pay attention to it, and it's the creation of trees. What is special about the creation of trees? That it is perhaps the only thing that we have kind of a detailed description of it. As, as you understand, you know, the whole narrative of creation is there is something pesuki, and where everything is narrated, right? So it has to be very, very concise. And there are not many graphic details. But here we have one very small graphic detail that it became like a binyan ab. Like, you know what a binyan ab is? Like, like, like the model for every other creation. And what does it say? Bore Olam created the trees, all right? And he. Uh, the, the, the earth uh, brought for aets ose peri asher zarobo lemineu. What does it mean? Aets ose peri. Fruit bearing tree. The oxygen for the world. <laughs> what does it mean? Aets ose peri. What? A tree that makes its food. A tree that makes its fruits. Yes. Fruitful, which no, means what? Makes it the food. Yeah, which means? It has the potential to make fruit. Has the potential. What else? All right. This is understood by Rashi, by, and by all translations. A tree bearing fruits, also very, already with these fruits. Which means what? Which means what? This is a very important thing. It's it's perpetual. No. It was, it was made whole. It was created. It was created. created. With the fruits, in other words, the trees were not created as seeds. The trees were not created as, as little shrubs, little, sh or little, little trees. Sprouts. The, the trees were created fully, go ahead, complete the plan. Grown. Yeah. Fully yeah. grown, fully developed, already with their fruits. Okay? Now, imagine I am a scientist. And I developed the time tunnel. I go now to the time of creation. And I found I'm confronting the tree that was created somehow I know was created five minutes ago by Moreola. If I am a scientist and I see this tree, what age I'm going to attribute and estimate for this tree as a scientist? Would I say five minutes? No. no. How old I, I, I would say this tree is? Five years. At least four years. Fifty years. It depends how many rings it has. So if it, 
if it was created with these fruits, it has to have rings. It has to have 10, 20, 30 rings. Imagine it had 30 rings. So I cut the tree. I said, oh, 30 rings, 30 years. This tree is 30 years old. Am I going to be wrong from the point of view of the scientist? No. Scientifically, that's, that's exactly the same. Now, is this tree now really five minutes old or 30 years old? Both. 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 Let me tell you something again, a very long story, very short. Creation is not something that happens in our daily world. Something that happens only once. Now, one of the consequences of creation in the way that Hazal described because of the trees, they said, I'm going to use their language, called Ma'ase, Ma'ase with you at the end, called Ma'ase Bereshit, which means all the creatures of Bereshit, they were created fully developed. Fully developed. They had okay. to be. The, yeah, they had to be, of course. They had to be because if there would have been trees, right. there would have been oxygen. Right, right, right. Very good. Then Excellent. Then Excellent. Excellent. Perfect. Perfect. So, if from every point of view, they had to be born and created the world that, that way. So, you understand that creation, the act of creation, uh, uh, with the eyes of Hazal implies that there are always two simultaneous different ages. This doesn't happen in any other phenomena, only in creation. So, of course, that if you're a scientist and you say, Mount Everest, 60 million years, you are right. It would have taken 60 million years if it wouldn't be for Borea Olam that is there creating it in a, in a second. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, to me, this is like the simple, I have five answers for the problem of time. This is the simplest one. And I think the one that covers almost everything. Let me, one, one more thing. Hazar said, if you go to the creation of Adam Rishon, five minutes after it's created, okay? So what would you say? What, what would you see? A baby? No. A baby? A 10 year old child? No. Hazal said he was created with a body of 20 years old. So you're a scientist, you see him, and you examine you know, his bones, etc., his weight. What would you say? How old is Adam Arishon? You would say 20, right? But now you ask Adam Arishon, how old are you? And he would say, well, I'm five minutes. And he would say, five minutes. He would say, like a hundred breath, breathings or breaths, okay? Uh, breaths. All right? Now again, you have these two simultaneous different ages. That would be impossible to, to think that science yeah, would say, well, 5,777 uh, years. That's simultaneous. You won't believe that Hashem created No, 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 no. It no. doesn't believe. I know, I know. But they were created with an age, developed. Now, again, it's a very long thing. It depends also how Boreolam created the world. For example, Mount Everest. How was created? Boreolam put Mount Everest like that, or did he activate all the seismic uh, plate tectonics uh, movements to uh, raise Mount Everest as it is? All right? Now, there are evidences from the book of Job that Boreolam didn't create Mount Everest and, and make it fall from heaven, like, like in one piece. He created it slowly, slowly in our, in our, but at an incredible speed. So one second or whatever, for Boreolam there is no time, all right? But if that is the way he created it, Mount Everest doesn't look like 60 million. It has 60 million years in it. You understand what I'm saying? It has, like Adam Arishon has a body of 20 years old. So uh, forcefully, you will find always, if creation happened the way we believe, you will always find this. Now, if you're a young guy and you don't know this, they don't teach you this in school. And you go to NYU, you go to Columbia, you go to Brooklyn College, whatever, and, and you are faced with 15 million years, 6 billion years, whatever it is. So you will, you will see yourself as primitive. Oh, wow, my community is primitive. They think 5,000 years. So we, we need to, you see, now, in this problem, 
where was, what was missing? Our reading of the word or our reading of the Torah? I think our reading of the Torah. We were not reading carefully the Torah to see what the Torah and, and what Hazal said, that everything was created. Bekomatan. All right. How much time do we have? One, one more um, example. Now it has to do with evolution. But again, with reading correctly or incorrectly the Torah. Let me ask you a question. When was the sun created? Fourth day. Fourth day. Fourth day. So, you know, this, this is from Torah Umada Journal. Torah Umada Journal from Yeshiva University. Uh, Carl Faith, which is a very important professor, it's an article from 1990. This is what he says. There is a big, big fundamental problem in the, in the interplay between Torah and evolution. And I think some of you said it already. There are a number of fundamental differences between the biblical sequence of creation and the evolutionary theory. For example, number one, the biblical account maintains that the plants were created day three before the sun was created day four, contrary to any existing theory of evolution. So that's it. I think that we can say, all right, the Torah is wrong. All right, this uh, archive this, this is not for us. And uh, there is a wrong uh, account here. You cannot create the sun after plants, because plants cannot swallow with the sun. So that's it. I'm finished. Unfortunately, you know, we have better to question. admit that the Torah is very old, right? The, the better wait, 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 wait. There is a fundamental problem. I have read, to write my book, a lot of books, you know, from scientists about uh, the Genesis of Big Bang, the, uh, Nathan Abiezer, blah, 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 blah. And they are great scientists. But I have to say that, unfortunately, they deal and they work with translations and with, with, with what I call Morash Hashanah information. Morash Hashanah was my teacher in, the kind, in kindergarten, okay? But I, I, I hope you understand what I mean by Morash Hashanah, like uh, the, the ideas that come from kindergarten. So it is, it is Morash Hashanah's fault, but also the, the elementary school and the uh, high school that continue with Morash Hoshana thinking that the sun was created the fourth day. That is wrong, ladies and gentlemen. Like, gentlemen sorry. It's wrong. According to Hazal, according to Rabbi Akiva, not all, there, there were some debates, as there is debate, there are debates in everything. All right? But according to Hazal, to the majority of the opinion, according to Harambam, according to Radak, according to Rashi, the sun was created the first day. The first day, not the fourth day. So, of course, you will find contradiction and it's, uh, it's not compatible, the fact that you have uh, plants before the sun, if you were right, and the sun was created the fourth day. But again, here, what was the fundamental problem that even professors, they were reading the Torah incorrectly. They didn't take the time to analyze it. What I, what I show in my book is that once you go deeper into Hazal and into the Hebrew of the Torah, and you don't work just with translations and with second-hand information, then you have a different, a better narrative of the Torah, which happens to be completely compatible with what science is finding. So you see, what I want to say is that we are preparing our children wrongly. We are giving them the wrong information, which, at least in the field of science versus uh, Torah, is hurting them. One more thing. With this, I'm going to finish. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. If you read 
most translations, all of them, in any language. I, I brought here what I think is one of the most biased translations, which happens to be the number one translation into English of the whole Tanakh. But it's completely biased. I would need like one hour and a half to explain to you this in length. But I'm going to give you just one example. Okay? When was life created? If you see the Torah is so precise. First of all, Borean creates the inorganic matter, the sun, all right, light. There is water in er on earth, there is wind. Second day, the atmosphere is created. This is the rakia. The cycle of water is created in the second day because without fresh water, you cannot have plants, right? Then only the third day, like, is a progressive creation. The third day, Borealam separates uh, land and, and, and we have dry land in which plants could be. And plants are the food for all the life. So first of all, Borealam creates everything that is needed for life. And also, plants recreate oxygen and renew oxygen, which is necessary for life. All right? Uh, fourth day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip. I have three chapters on the on the on the third. It's, it's, it's the most fascinating thing, but it will take me half hour to explain it to you. And only the fifth day, Borealan creates animals. Animals. First of all, it creates the what? What kind of animals were created the fifth day? Fish and birds. Fish and birds. Fish and bird. That's an incomplete uh, reading. Yeah, right? according to the Peshat. Taninim doesn't, doesn't mean it's not fish, it's not bear. All right? These alligators. Uh, no. Right, right, okay. Whatever uh, those mean, mean, but whatever they mean, they're not fish and birds. You see what I mean? And these are the first animal mentioned here. Okay, now, uh, I, I, I study this deeply. And what I found, and this one rabbi that said that, only one I found, I, I actually two. Uh, Rabbi Meir, and then there is one rabbi, uh, his name was Maurice Rafal, from Sweden, and he came to America. He was the first rabbi to address the US Congress. Uh, and, um, and now he said, and they said, in the fifth day, the oviparous animals were created. Reptiles, amphibious, uh, arthropods, Fish and bird. All this is in the fifth day. Oviparos, oh, sorry. Oviparos means uh, animals that come from egg. As opposed to? An egg. egg. As opposed to? Mammals. Eggs? Mammals. Right? Eggs. Yes. <coughs> Oviparos. Yes. All these come from eggs. All right. As opposed to? The six days, mammals. So you, you see the perfect order. In that six day, man was created. First, Borodam creates matter. Then he creates life in the fifth day and sixth days sixth day then he create he creates intelligent life everything is progressive it's so beautiful it's so compact i think evolution copied the torah and especially when you compare what the torah says what with what the myths of the near eastern say about creation it's, it's, it's the most beautiful thing <laughs> the most modern thing that you can have now, again, just to finish, what does it mean the word taninim? It's not alligators. For example, when Moshe Rabbeinu shows the staff, his, his staff, uh, Vaili Tanin, he became an alligator? Snake, snake. A snake, right? Okay. Sometimes it's alligator. Sometimes it's crocodile. Sometimes it's snake. Sometimes kefir betanin. We don't know what is that kefir betanin, but it's a very dangerous animal. Now, in which group you will include snakes, alligators, and crocodiles? You tell me a word in English that includes this species. Reptiles. Reptiles, thank you. And what does it mean, Gedolim? Large. Large, big. Okay. In 1750, in 1750, a word was coined by Richard Owen. He coined a word because they saw fossils of big, big animals. And 
in the ancient times, they thought that these, these were dragons, etc. Now, he coined the word. He said, these are going to be called dinosaurs. Now, listen to this. Dinosaurs is a, is a word that is composed of two words. Saurus, in Greek, means reptiles. And dino or dino, in Greek, means big. Oh, wait a second. What did I say? Dino is big, big. And Saurus means what? Okay. Reptiles. And what is the Torah saying here? Vaibra Elohim et. Why in the world no one translates the big reptiles? I'm not saying dinosaurs, but just the big reptiles. The Torah, if this is true, the, what, what, that which I'm showing it to you, then the Torah is the first book. To, re re to record the existence of dinosaurs. When, when all the rest of the, uh, the civilization of the world were talking about monsters and dragons, the Torah talks about Tanin Yudoli. And these are the first animals to be created in the fifth day, the first one, the oldest one to be created. Now, if you, oh, if you read the translation, which is bias, it says something terrible. It says, God created the great sea monsters. Ha! First of all, why sea? And why monsters? <clears throat> Do you know that there is no Hebrew word for monsters? We don't believe in monsters. It says here, Tarinim Gedolim. But for, in this case, for bias reason, because they want to show that the Torah is a myth, Hasbe Shalom, like all the other myths of the Middle East or Near East, and they talk about monsters, like Enuma Elch, etc. So, oh, then, then they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we found monsters in the Torah. So it means that the Jews borrowed this from the Sumerians. You understand the trick? But this is not what it says. It says that in Gedolim. Now, if we don't have all this information and more, our children, our, our young adults, they go to college and say, oh, you believe in a book that believes in great sea monsters? Come on, don't be so primitive. But actually the Torah doesn't believe in sea monsters. It's JPS that believes in, in, in sea monsters. The Torah believed and, 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 and wrote Tanin Gedolim, great reptiles. The only book from antiquity that is recording the, 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 the forces that, that were discovered much, much later. All right, so I, I just wanted to give you a few examples about science and Torah. And I will end from what I began. In the Barreku, Mikem. When the Torah is irrelevant, when the Torah is not, you know, like in this case, it's not compatible with what we should be finding, is because we are lacking the understanding. Or we are not doing our job good enough. We are not reading here, the Hebrew, we're reading the English. <coughs> we are working with second-hand information. We are not having enough scholarship and patience and amal batorah. They had to put seed in the, in, the, in the abanim, in the stones. And one of the things is that you have to your next go and scrape. scrap until you find the truth. You cannot just look at the surface. Especially when there is so much bias out there. And especially when our, the education of our children is at stake. It's a big, big, big stake here. Okay? So uh, I finish. If you have any questions, I will be willing to Yes, I would like to comment something. 